Hi everyone. Before we move on to this week's case, I just wanted to address a couple of things which have happened since the last one. During the last episode, I paid tribute to all the first responders who risk their lives every day to keep us safe. Therefore, not only do I want to dedicate this episode to the memory of Victoria, but I also want it to be a memory of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Constable Heidi Stevenson, who was tragically killed when a gunman disguised as a policeman killed 18 people in Nova Scotia in Canada on the 20th of April. I would also like to dedicate this episode to Senior Constable Lynette Taylor, Constable Glenn Humphreys, Senior Constable Kevin King, and Constable Josh Presney, who were killed when a truck driver collided with their routine traffic stop on the side of the Eastern Freeway in Melbourne, Australia on the 22nd of April. My thoughts and prayers, and I'm sure that everyone listening's thoughts, go out to the families at this time. Stay safe, everyone. True Crime Fix is a podcast with adult themes and graphic descriptions of crime which may not be considered suitable for all ages. Please use your discretion when listening. All research has been conducted using material in the public domain and some opinions may not be that of the author or the host. Please remember that all victims are someone's loved one and all episodes are recorded in the utmost respect of their memory. You're listening to the True Crime Fix Podcast with your host, Steve. Hello again everyone, and welcome to episode 36 and our 31st case together. If you've enjoyed the show so far, then please make sure that you've subscribed on your chosen podcast directory and all the new episodes will automatically download for you upon release. You can also listen to the new episodes through the website too, so go over to www.truecrimefixpodcast.co.uk and all of the episodes are at the base of the home screen. The episodes are also now available on YouTube, on the True Crime Fix channel. So please, if you do enjoy the show, spread the word as far as possible. So those of you who follow me on social media know that I recently watched the devastating case of Gabriel Fernandez on Netflix and was quite vocal about how no one stepped in on behalf of that poor child throughout the whole ordeal. It reminded me of a case when I was younger that I remembered reading about. And today, I'm just going to go straight into it. Warning, this case does include graphic descriptions of crimes against a child, so may not be suitable for all listeners. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, this is your true crime fix. I'm your host Steve, and this episode has been dedicated to the memory of Victoria Klimbier. Victoria Adjo Klimbier was born near Abidjan in the Côte d'Ivoire, or the Ivory Coast as it's known in English, on the 2nd of November 1991. Abidjan is a city on the southern Atlantic coast of the Côte d'Ivoire in West Africa. It's the country's major urban centre with skyscrapers rising above the Ibre Lagoon. Victoria was the fifth of seven children to Bert and Moussi and Francois Colombier, and according to her parents, she had a healthy and happy early childhood. She started school at the age of six and showed herself to be intelligent and articulate. She seems to have been a child who stood out, always dancing and always happy. 
In October 1998, Marie-Therese Quau, who was a distant in-law to Bert and Francis, but still an aunt to Victoria, turned up at the Kalimbe house. Quau had lived in France for some years, but was visiting the Ivory Coast to attend the funeral of her brother. She told Bert and Francis that she wanted to take a child back to France with her and arrange for his or her education. Apparently, Victoria was happy to be chosen. In fact, Victoria was a late substitute for another young girl called Anna, whom Quau had originally intended to take. However, Anna's parents had second thoughts about sending her to France. The change must have taken place really late, as the in air quotes daughter named on Quau's French passport was called Anna. So this is also the name by which Victoria would be known throughout her life from there on in, but I'm still going to refer to her by her birth name. After leaving her parents' house, Victoria travelled first to another part of the Ivory Coast, where she stayed with Quau's brother. Shortly after, sometime in November 1998, she and Quau flew to Paris. Victoria spent approximately five months in France. She lived in Rue Georges Mille in the region of Villepin, which is just south of the main Charles de Gaulle airport. In the beginning, Quau seemed prepared to honour her promise to make sure that Victoria received a proper education. Shortly after her arrival in France, Victoria was enrolled in the Jean Moulin Primary School in Villepin. However, by December 1998, Quau began to receive formal warnings from the school about Victoria's absenteeism. The situation became serious enough by February 1999 for the school to issue a child at risk emergency notification. A social worker became involved and she reported a difficult mother and child relationship between Victoria and Quau. Some of Victoria's absences from school were justified by medical certificates, all of which said she needed rest. When she was at school, staff worried about Victoria's tendency to fall asleep in class. As a result, the school formed the view that Victoria was clinically unwell and being monitored and treated by doctors. The head teacher, Monsieur Donnet, also recalled Quau mentioning that Victoria suffered from some form of dermatological condition. Sometime in the spring of 1999, Quau gave the school notice that she was removing Victoria so that she could receive treatment in London. The home address of Esther Acker was given as a forwarding address. Esther was a distant relative of Quau, and the two had been in intermittent contact for the previous two years. When Victoria went to say goodbye to her classmates on the 25th of March 1999, Monsieur Donnet noticed that Victoria had a shaven head and was wearing a wig. Why Quau decided to leave France for the UK is unclear. For a long while before leaving, she had been claiming benefits that she was not entitled to. The French Benefits Agency was trying to recover the money from these benefits, and this could have influenced her decision. Quau and Victoria boarded a flight from Paris to London on the 24th of April 1999. They travelled on Quau's French passport, in which Victoria was described as her daughter. 
the picture in the passport was not of Victoria, but Anna, the child who she had replaced. The two children did not look particularly similar, so it is likely that Victoria was made to wear a wig so that she looked more like the child in the photograph. When they arrived in the UK, Quow and Victoria went to Acton in West London and moved into a double room in a bed and breakfast in Twyford Crescent. The reservation had been made in France and lasted until the 1st of May 1999. At about 4.30 on the 25th of April 1999, Victoria and Quow paid an unannounced visit to Esther Acker. Esther had just come home from work when she heard the doorbell ring at her house in Hanwell, a town which regular listeners to this podcast will be familiar with. Victoria was introduced to her as Anna. Despite being somewhat taken aback by their presence, Esther invited Quow and Victoria inside. The first thing that Esther noticed was that Victoria was wearing a wig. This was also remarked on by Esther's daughter, Grace, who joined her in a visit to see Victoria and Quow later in the day. Grace removed the wig from Victoria's head to discover that she had no hair and her scalp was covered with patchy marks. She also thought that Victoria looked rather small and frail, but neither she nor her mother noticed anything inappropriate or disturbing about Victoria's behaviour or her interaction with Quow. The following day, Quow and Victoria visited Ealing's homeless persons unit because they needed somewhere to live when their week in Twyford Crescent ran out. The unit agreed to provide them with accommodation in a hostel situated at Nickel Road in Harlston and they moved in around the 1st of May. Over the next few weeks, Victoria and Quow attended the Ealing Social Services several times to collect substance payments and, on one occasion, to complain about the standard of their accommodation. During this period, concerns first started to emerge. A number of Ealing staff who saw Quow and Victoria together during May 1999 noticed a marked difference between Quow's appearance, she was always well dressed, and that of Victoria, who was far scruffier. Deborah Gaunt, who saw the two of them together on the 24th of May 1999, went as far as to say she thought Victoria looked like an advertisement for Action Aid. It is unclear how Victoria passed her days during her first months she spent in the Nickel Road Hostel. No effort was made by either Quow or Ealing Social Services to enrol her in any form of education or daycare activity and there was no evidence to indicate that she had any friends or playmates. On the 8th of June, Quow took Victoria to a GP surgery on Acton Lane in Harlesden. Here, she was seen by the practice nurse, Grace Moore. Nurse Moore did not carry out a physical examination of Victoria because she was reported not to have any current health problems or complaints. On the 10th of June, Quow began a relationship with Carl Manning. He had been driving a bus which had been boarded by Quow and the two had fallen into conversation. According to Manning, he gave Quow his telephone number and she called him a few days later, inviting him to visit her at Nickel Road. There was a significant age difference between the two, with Quow being 15 years Manning's senior. Shortly afterwards, Victoria began to show what may have been early signs of deliberate physical harm. Esther, who had not seen Victoria since her visit six weeks earlier, 
bumped into Victoria and Quao on the street on the 14th of June. Victoria was wearing a dress with long sleeves, leaving only her face and hands exposed. Esther noticed a fresh scar on Victoria's right cheek, which Quao told her had been caused when Victoria fell on an escalator. Esther was significantly concerned by what she had seen of Victoria in the street to visit Nickel Road on the 17th of June. In her opinion, she thought that the accommodation was unsuitable for a child because it was dirty, cramped and ill-equipped. She also thought that Victoria had lost weight since she had last seen her. An unnamed Ghanaian man was present and he told Esther that he was concerned about the way that Quao treated Victoria. The following day, Esther made the first of her two anonymous telephone calls to Brent Social Services. By the middle of June, Victoria was spending the majority of her days being looked after by Priscilla Cameron, an experienced but unregistered childminder. Quao had approached Priscilla when she had got a job at Northwick Park Hospital on the 8th of June. Typically, Victoria would not arrive until around 7am and then not be picked up sometimes until as late as 10pm. She would watch television, draw, play and often took a nap after lunch. Her English improved and she appeared to have struck up a good relationship with Priscilla's adult son, Patrick, whom she showed how to dance her native dance from her home country. Priscilla was not greatly impressed by the way that Victoria was treated by Quao. She noticed that Quao would often speak to her very harshly in French, often looking as if she was telling her off. On one occasion, when Priscilla mentioned to Quao that Victoria would sometimes move household objects around when she shouldn't, she was shocked to hear Quao shout at Victoria that she was a wicked girl, something she repeated on numerous occasions. Her unease was increased by a conversation she had with a woman who she referred to as Nigerian Mary, who asked Priscilla, what it was that she said to Quao that made her beat Victoria every night. Both Priscilla and her son recalled that Victoria would become very quiet and reserved when Quao arrived to the house to take her home. Victoria tended to look down at the floor, rubbing her hands together whenever Quao was present. On several occasions, Victoria turned up at Priscilla's address with a number of small cuts on her fingers. When questioned about them, Quao said that they had been caused by Victoria playing with razor blades. Patrick also noticed marks on Victoria's face, although these were not serious and he thought they could have been caused by ordinary childish games. Quao's relationship with Manning developed quickly. On the 6th of July, Victoria and Quao moved into his flat at 267 Somerset Gardens in Tottenham, which is just off of White Hart Lane. The flat was really no more than a small bedsit. I work in social housing as I've explained before, just to explain the difference between a bedsit or a studio flat compared to a normal flat. A bedsit is literally one room, where you have your bedroom and living area. Usually, they are old converted Victorian houses, which were, back in the day, six bedroom houses, and they are converted into six flats. Housing more people in an already overpopulated city. There was a separate bathroom and kitchen area but only one room for all three people to sleep in. The bedsit contained a bed and a sofa bed. 
Manning and Quow slept on the bed, whilst Victoria slept on the sofa bed. This arrangement continued until October, when Victoria's sofa bed was thrown out and she began to spend her nights in the bathroom. It is obvious that Manning was not agreeing with this living situation, as on the 13th of July, according to Patricia, Quow had turned up in an agitated state on her doorstep, asking her to take Victoria for good. Patricia refused, but agreed to take Victoria in for one night, as the poor child was looking so ill. Quow then presented Patricia with two large bags full of Victoria's clothes. When she arrived, Victoria was wearing a baseball cap pulled down over her brow. When Patricia asked her to remove it, she saw what she took to be a burn the size of a 50 pence piece on Victoria's face. Patrick also noticed three circular marks on Victoria's lower right jaw, which looked to him like injuries that had been healing for a little while. Both he and Patricia noticed that Victoria's eyes were bloodshot, and Patricia also observed a loose piece of skin hanging from her right eyelid. Patricia's opinion as to the likely cause of these injuries was shown by the fact that she asked Quow before she left who had burned and beaten Victoria. Quow replied that all of the injuries were self-inflicted. Patricia gave Victoria a clean pair of pyjamas and put her to bed. Later that evening, she heard groaning coming from the room and went to see what was the matter. Victoria was asleep, but Patricia saw that her face was swollen and her fingers were oozing with pus. Patricia called her daughter Avril to come and have a look. They agreed that Victoria had to be taken to hospital. The next morning, Avril took Victoria to see Marie Cader, a French teacher at her son's school. She wanted to discover the cause of the injuries, as well as get them treated. Miss Cader noticed injuries to Victoria's face and fingers, but Victoria was reluctant to talk about how she had got them. She advised Avril to take Victoria to hospital. Avril took Victoria to the Accident and Emergency Department of Central Middlesex Hospital at around 11am on the 14th of July. Victoria was seen by Dr Benyon within an hour of her arrival. Dr Benyon took her history from Avril, which together with the results of a basic examination of Victoria, concerned him enough to refer the matter to a paediatric registrar. In his view, there was a strong possibility that this was a case of non-accidental injury. The paediatric registrar who saw her next was Dr Ajay Obi. She performed a more extensive physical examination than Dr Benyon and discovered a large number of injuries on Victoria's body, which she recorded on a set of body maps. The entire investigation took about two hours. She formed the view that at least some of Victoria's injuries might have been non-accidental. Dr Ajay Obi arranged for Victoria to be admitted overnight and called Brent Social Services to inform them of her discovery. The police were told and Victoria was placed under police protection at 5.20pm. The medical notes stated that there was to be no unsupervised visits by Victoria's mother. That evening, a very agitated and displeased Quow discovered from the Camerons that Victoria had been admitted to Central Middlesex Hospital. She went to hospital 
and was there when Dr. Ruby Schwartz saw Victoria as part of her evening ward round. As a result of her examination that evening, Dr. Schwartz concluded that Victoria was suffering from scabies. Due to the infectious nature of scabies, Victoria was nursed in isolation for the rest of her stay on the ward. The next morning, the police had withdrawn their protection after the diagnosis of scabies and Quail returned to the hospital and left with Victoria. The first agency they visited on leaving the hospital was Ealing Social Services in the Acton area office. Quail left Victoria in the waiting room on her own for over an hour, much to the annoyance of a social worker named Pamela Fortune. They spent that night in a hotel in Wembley before returning to Somerset Gardens the next day. On the way, they stopped off at the Cameron's house to collect Victoria's clothes. Patricia tried to speak to Victoria, but she would not answer her. Patrick was also there and recalled that Victoria seemed totally different from the other times that he had seen her. She would not smile at him and she would not respond when he said hello to her in French. The clothes were retrieved and Quau and Victoria left. Apart from one occasion when Patricia saw Quau and Victoria walking together down the street, the Camerons never saw either of them again. Just over a week later, on the 24th of July, Victoria was back in hospital. This time, it was the North Middlesex Hospital and Quau had brought her in herself. Her most urgent injury was a serious scold to the face, which Quau said was caused by Victoria placing her head under the hot tap in the bathroom to try and relieve the itching caused by her scabies. According to one of the version of events put forward by Quau, she had been asleep in bed at around midday when a scream from the bathroom woke her up. Victoria's burns were so serious she was admitted to the paediatric ward known as the Rainbow Ward where she stayed for the next 13 nights. At about 11pm on the 24th of July, Dr Simone Forley, the senior house officer who first examined her, explained the position to Haringey Social Services. A more detailed referral was made three days later by Karen Johns, an Enfield social worker based at the hospital. As a result, a strategy meeting was held at Haringey's offices on the 28th of July 1999 and Victoria's case was allocated to a social worker called Lisa Arthurwery. A number of medical staff who cared for Victoria during her stay on the Rainbow Ward noticed marks on her body which they considered were signs of serious, deliberate physical harm. Nurse Beatrice Norman saw what she thought was a belt buckle mark on Victoria's shoulder and nurse Millicent Graham noticed a mark which made her suspect that Victoria had been deliberately burned. Nurse Grace Pereira, who bathed Victoria the following day, saw marks which led her to believe that Victoria had been hit with a belt and bitten. It seemed that Victoria had started to suffer serious deliberate harm by late July 1999. This was also indicated by her behaviour when Quau and Manning came to visit her on the ward. She gave the impression of being frightened of them. When Quau came onto the ward, Victoria changed from being lively and vivacious to withdrawn and timid, and the relationship between her and Quau was recorded in the ward's critical incident log as being 
that of a master and a servant. On one occasion, she was seen to wet herself while standing to attention in front of a seated quail, who was apparently telling her off. Her reaction to Manning when he came to visit seemed to be very similar. He said Victoria seemed wary of his presence and was anxious to keep her distance from him. Neither he nor Quow ever brought Victoria anything in the way of clothes, food, toys or treats throughout the fortnight that she spent in hospital. When Quow was not around, Victoria seemed to have enjoyed her time on the Rainbow Ward. She certainly became something of a favourite of several of the nurses, including Nurse Lucerne Taub, a French speaker, whom Dr Mary Rossiter, the hospital's named doctor for child protection, had asked to befriend Victoria. She liked to dress up and was given clothes to dress up in by the nursing staff. Nurse Taub would take her to see the babies in the neonatal ward and brought her sweets and treats. According to Dr Rossiter, she was a little ray of sunshine. Apart from Quow and Manning, the only other visitors that Victoria received while she was in North Middlesex Hospital were from social worker Miss Arthur Worry and PC Karen Jones. They visited on the 6th of August 1999 and after speaking briefly with Victoria decided it would be appropriate for her to be discharged back into Quow's care. The brief interlude in her life in this country during which Victoria was safe, happy and well and cared for had ended. She left the North Middlesex Hospital with Quow at approximately 8pm on the 6th of August 1999. They went straight back to Manning's flat in Somerset Gardens, where Victoria was to spend the remaining seven months of her life. Barry Almeida, a senior Harangay social worker, referred the Victoria Climbier case to the NSPCC-run Tottenham Child and Family Centre on the 5th of August 1999. However, the centre was confused as to why it was being handed the file and the notes suggested that it was not their type of case. The centre's Sylvia Henry says she spoke to Mr Almeida to clarify matters and was told that the family were no longer in the borough so the case had actually been closed. Social worker Lisa Arthurwari eventually made two visits to Carl Manning's flat after Victoria had been discharged, the first being on the 16th of August 1999, ten days afterwards. The second took place days after Manning had began to force Victoria to sleep in the bath again. Lisa Arthurwari and Victoria met on four occasions where they were together for the total of less than 30 minutes and barely spoke to each other. Since her arrival in the UK, Quow had shown an interest in attending church. According to Pat Mensah, a Baptist pastor based at a church in northwest London, Quow started visiting her church on a fairly regular basis from the middle of May 1999. The move to Manning's flat in early July may have prompted her to look elsewhere. On the 29th of August 1999, Quow and Victoria attended the Mission Ensemble Poor Christ, a church which meets in a hall close to Borough High Street near the iconic Borough Market. The pastor here was Pascal Oram. He, at a later date, gave a detailed recollection of Victoria's appearance when he first met her. Despite the weather, Victoria was dressed in heavy clothing that covered all of her body apart from her head and her hands. 
he noticed wounds on both and advised Quow to cut Victoria's hair shorter so that the injuries to her scalp could breathe. Quow told him about Victoria's incontinence and he formed the opinion that she was possessed by an evil spirit. He advised that the problem could be solved by prayer. Two weeks after her first visit to the church, Quow phoned Pastor Arome and told him that following a brief improvement, Victoria's incontinence had returned. He claimed that he had reproached her from being insufficiently vigilant and allowed the evil spirit to return. Whatever its cause, the incontinence appears to have continued throughout the rest of September because it was in October, according to Manning, that the sofa bed Victoria had been sleeping on was thrown out and she began to spend her nights again in the bathroom. The bathroom in Manning's flat was small and the door opened out into the living room. There was no window and although there was a heater, it was either broken or unused. When Victoria was inside, the door was kept closed and the light was switched off. She began to spend her nights alone, cold and in pitch black darkness. However, Lisa Arthurwery noticed nothing untoward when she made the second of her two pre-announced home visits to Somerset Gardens on the 28th of October. The purpose of her visit was to explain to Quow that the housing application made after the previous visit in August had been turned down and to discuss the remaining options. Victoria seems to have been ignored during this visit as she sat on the floor playing with a doll. The fact that she was still at home and not attending school was raised during the conversation but no questions seem to have been asked about how Victoria was spending her days. During the course of their conversation, Miss Arthur Worry told Quow that the council only accommodated children who were at risk of serious harm and that in the council's view, Victoria was not at such risk. On the 1st of November 1999, Quow telephoned Miss Arthur Worry and told her that Manning had been sexually harming Victoria. Miss Arthurwery told Quow to come into our office. Quow arrived with Victoria and Manning later that morning. Quow then cited three separate instances of sexual abuse. Victoria was then spoken to alone and repeated what Quow had said almost verbatim. She appeared very anxious to be believed and both Miss Arthurwery and the other social worker present, Valerie Robertson, thought that she had been coached. However, in Miss Arthurwery's view, Victoria did not seem to be a particularly nervous, frightened or fearful child on this occasion. The short-term solution was devised by Miss Arthurwery to deal with the sexual harm allegations was to arrange for somewhere else for Victoria to stay while the allegations were investigated. From there, the details are very sketchy about the last four months of Victoria's life. It is likely that Victoria spent most of this four-month period in the Somerset Gardens flat. However, there is some evidence to suggest that she made two trips to France towards the end of 1999. Manning, in the aftermath, recalled that he and Quow and Victoria all went to Paris about the 11th of November. They stayed for a long weekend at Quow's son's house, where Victoria was allowed to sleep in a bed. The second visit to France seems to have been made on the 29th of November, where they stayed until the 12th of December. Whatever the purpose of these two visits to France, they appear to have made very little difference 
in the pattern of Victoria's life when she returned to Somerset Gardens. She continued to be forced to sleep in the bath, and from November onwards, she was tied up in a black plastic sack in order to stop her from soiling the bath. Things deteriorated on the eve of the millennium. In the aftermath, a disturbing entry in Manning's diary was discovered. In it, he describes an argument with Quow, which ended by her returning to his flat in order to release Satan from her bag. This refinement of the torture meant that Victoria spent extended periods lying in her own urine and faeces. Due to the effect that the chemical balance of her bodily waste was having on her skin, the couple abandoned the plan, fearing questions would be asked. Despite no longer being kept in a bag, Victoria began to spend more and more time in the bathroom in January 2000. Not only did she continue to sleep in the bath, but she also began to spend some of her days in it as well. At the start of the new year, Quow and Manning had began to serve Victoria her meals in the bath. This was done by placing the food on a piece of plastic or a plastic bag and placing it in the bath next to Victoria. She would generally be given whatever Manning and Quow had cooked for themselves but by the time it reached her, it was usually stone cold. Given that her hands were kept bound with masking tape, she was forced to eat by pushing her face towards the food like a dog. Whilst researching this, I couldn't help but wonder about the couple's personal hygiene as well. If you are keeping a child prisoner in a bath, how are you keeping yourself clean? as well as being forced to spend much of her time in inhumane conditions, Victoria was also beaten on a regular basis by both Quow and Manning. Quow used to strike Victoria on a daily basis, sometimes using a variety of weapons. These included a shoe, a hammer, a coat hanger and a wooden cooking spoon. The forensic examination of the flat in the aftermath revealed traces of Victoria's blood on the walls, on Manning's football boots and on the sole of one of his trainers. He also admitted to sometimes using a bicycle chain. Given the very limited contact Victoria had with the outside world in the weeks leading up to her death, it is very difficult to identify with any accuracy the speed with which her condition deteriorated to the state where she was admitted to North Middlesex Hospital on the 24th of February 2000. By Saturday the 19th of February, Victoria was very ill. On this day, Quow took her to the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God, housed in the old Rainbow Theatre on the Seven Sisters Road. Audrey Hartley Martin, who was assisting Pastor Alvaro Lima in the administration of the 3pm service, noticed the two of them coming up the stairs. They were shouting at each other and Victoria seemed to be having difficulty in walking. Quow and Victoria were disturbing the service, so Miss Hartley Martin took Victoria downstairs to the crash. She noticed that Victoria was shivering and asked her if she was cold. Victoria replied that she was not cold, but she was very hungry. Miss Hartley Martin obtained some biscuits for her from the kitchen and Victoria hid them in her pocket when Quow came down to collect her. At the end of the service, Pastor Lima spoke to Quow about the difficulties she said she was having with Victoria, particularly her incontinence. He expressed the view that Victoria's problems were due to her possession by an evil spirit, 
and said he would spend the week fasting on Victoria's behalf. He believed he made it clear that Victoria was not expected to fast herself. Quao was advised to bring Victoria back to church on the following Friday morning. According to Pastor Lima, Friday was the day on which prayers are said for deliverance from witchcraft, bad luck and everything bad and evil. On Saturday the 20th of February, Quao and Victoria returned to the church where they were seen by Pastor Celso Jr. Apparently, Victoria was very quiet and well behaved during the visit. On Wednesday the 23rd of February, Quao phoned Pastor Lima in the evening and told him Victoria's behaviour had improved in that she had ceased to cover the flat in excrement. On Thursday the 24th of February, Quao phoned Miss Hartley Martin and told her that Victoria had been asleep for two days and had not eaten or drunk anything. By the evening of the same day, Quao was sufficiently concerned to bring Victoria to the church and ask for help. Pastor Lima advised them to go to the hospital and a minicab was called. Salman Pinabazi, the minicab driver, was sufficiently concerned about Victoria's condition to take her to the nearby Tottenham ambulance station instead of directly to the hospital. She was then taken by ambulance to the North Middlesex Hospital whilst being treated by paramedics and admitted to the casualty unit. On arrival, Victoria was unconscious and very cold. Her temperature was 27 degrees Celsius. The natural body temperature is between 36.1 and 37.2 degrees Celsius. When the body drops below 35 degrees, it is classed as hypothermia. The doctors stated that when she arrived, the initial tests on her body temperature could not be taken on their usual equipment. Initial attempts to warm her up were unsuccessful and a paediatric consultant, Dr. Leslie Alsford, was called in to take responsibility for Victoria's treatment. Dr. Alsford arrived around midnight. Her examination of Victoria was very limited because her first wish was to increase Victoria's body temperature, which at this point was 28.7 degrees Celsius. In any event, she could not have recorded all the injuries she saw because they were too numerous. She formed the view that Victoria needed the type of intensive care facilities not available at the North Middlesex Hospital. She tried to find space at another hospital and was eventually successful. A team from the Paediatric Intensive Care Unit at St Mary's Hospital in Paddington arrived at 2.30am. Victoria was transferred to St Mary's Hospital where she remained in a critical condition with severe hypothermia and multi-system failure. The medical staff were unable to strengthen her legs. Over the hours that followed, Victoria suffered a number of episodes of respiratory and cardiac arrest. Her respiratory, cardiac and renal systems began to fail. At around 3pm, Victoria went into cardiac arrest for the last time. CPR was attempted, but Victoria did not respond. She was declared dead at 3.15pm on the 25th of February 2000. She was 8 years and 3 months old, and had only been in the UK for 308 days. A post-mortem examination was carried out the following day by Dr Nathaniel Carey, a Home Office accredited pathologist. He found the cause of death to be hypothermia, 
which had arisen in the context of malnourishment, a damp environment and restricted movement. He also found 128 separate injuries on Victoria's body, showing that she had been beaten with a range of sharp and blunt instruments. Dr. Carey mentioned that no part of her body had been spared. Marks on her wrists and ankles indicated that her arms and legs had been tied together. She weighed in at just 3 stone and 10 pounds, or 52 pounds. It was the worst case of deliberate harm to a child that he had ever seen. Quau was arrested on suspicion of neglect at the hospital at around 11.35pm on the 25th of February. She told the police, It is terrible, I've just lost my child. Manning was arrested the following afternoon as he returned to his flat. In November 2000, both Manning and Quau went on trial at the Old Bailey in London. Judge Richard Hawkins presided with Sally Howes QC, the prosecutor for the Crown. The trial lasted just over two months. Manning, Quau and the blindingly incompetent child protection authorities were to be judged. Manning denied murder but pleaded guilty to child cruelty and manslaughter. Quau denied all charges. Quau's defence was that Victoria's condition was due to the fact that she was possessed by demons. She maintained that throughout. Manning's defence was, although I am responsible for injuring her, at the time I injured her, I did not intend to cause her really serious bodily harm and I certainly did not intend to kill her. Sally Howes QC claimed that most of Manning's statements were almost incomprehensible. You could beat her and she would not cry at all. She could take the beatings and pain like anything. But while Manning did show some remorse, Quau showed no shame for her actions at all. Not only that, but her behaviour in court shocked everyone. Sally Howes QC stated after the trial, The way she chuckled in such a menacing way and laughed dismissively, yes, it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. This is the only time I have ever genuinely felt myself in the presence of evil. It was during the proceedings that it emerged that Quau used a hammer to break Victoria's toes and neither of them gave a satisfactory explanation as to why they treated Victoria the way they did. One suggestion is that Quau believed she may be able to access more benefits through the Department of Work and Pensions with a child. When this did not happen, she took her frustrations out on Victoria. The jury took four days to convict them. On the 12th of January 2001, almost a year after Victoria's death, they found both defendants guilty. Richard Hawkins said, What Anna endured was truly unimaginable. She died at both of your hands, a lonely, drawn-out death. I pass the only sentence I am entitled to pass, and that is life imprisonment. Even at the trial, Victoria was being referred to as Anna. On the 19th of January 2001, after being repatriated, Victoria's funeral took place at Grand Bassam, near Ivory Coast's main city, Abidjan. In April 2001, the government announced a public inquiry into the death being led by Lord Lamming. 
the inquiry was the first in Britain to use a special wide-ranging powers to look at everything from the role of social services to the police protection arrangements. Ministers made it clear that they expected the inquiry to scrutinise the child protection system and not just the failings in the Kalimbe case. The inquiry became the most extensive investigation into the child protection system in British history, costing £3.8 million and hearing from 158 witnesses and 121 child protection experts. The inquiry uncovered that child protection staff missed at least 12 chances to save Victoria. It also exposed a complete breakdown in the multi-agency child protection system established in the wake of the murder of seven-year-old Maria Colwell in 1973. Health, police, housing charities and social services failed to work together to protect Victoria. Lord Lamming's final report published in January 2003 concluded that the child protection system failed as a result of a lack of basic good practice by frontline staff and most significantly senior managers, failing to take responsibility for the failings of their organisations. The report made 108 recommendations. Its main proposals were aimed at holding those in senior positions from government ministers down to local authority chief executives to account. At the national level, it was proposed that a new agency for children and families, whose chief executive would be like a children's commissioner to advise the government on the impact of proposed policies and scrutinise legislation, as well as reviewing serious child abuse cases. Other major recommendations included the setting up of a national database recording every contact made by a child under 16 with the police, health and local authority services to prevent them from getting lost in the system. But alas, much like the ending of the Gabriel Fernandez case, this was not the last time that Haringey Social Services came under scrutiny. Peter Connolly would be brought into this world by his mother Tracy Connolly on the 1st of March 2006 and was cruelly and brutally taken again from it on the 3rd of August 2007 by his mother and her new partner. A lot of British listeners will know the name that he was referred to during the trial better. He was Baby P. He was found dead in a blood-stained cot with more than 50 injuries despite being on the child protection at-risk register and receiving 60 visits from social workers, police and health professionals over eight months. In 2008, two men, Stephen Barker, his stepfather, Barker's brother, Jason Owen, and Peter's mother, Tracy Connolly, were convicted by causing or allowing his death. Victoria would have been 20 this year, but instead she was taken from this world by someone who only saw her as a way to get free money. So that's it for this week, and my god that was a hard one to research and a hard one to read. Please remember, if you enjoy the show or want to know more, please follow us on Twitter at True Crime Fix Pod. That's at True Crime Fix Pod on Twitter. The podcast also has a Facebook page, True Crime Fix Podcast, but there's also a fan page, True Crime Fix Discussion. I'm thoroughly enjoying interacting with everyone on there, and this is where I post the majority of information on the week's cases. You can also visit the new website, www truecrimefixpodcast.co.uk Also a reminder that the podcast is now on Patreon 
so please visit www.patreon.com forward slash true crime fix podcast i also have an instagram account so search true crime fix also if you have any suggestions or feedback for the show please contact me at true crime fix podcast at gmail.com that's true crime fix podcast at gmail.com or the contact us page on the website until next time stay safe Look after each other and live life to the fullest because you never know who or what might be coming around the next corner. Take care everyone.